In the last couple of sections, we wrote out all the raw source code for our Fibonacci calculator application. We put together everything for the React server, the Express API, and the worker process as well. In this section, we're going to do a little bit of reconciliation. So if you decided to skip the last dozen or so videos where we wrote out all the raw source code, then stay around because I'm going to show you how to take the checkpoint.zip file that you downloaded out of the last section and apply it to your project to set everything up. If you did not skip those videos, so if you wrote all the code with me, then you have two choices. You can either continue on right now and use all the source code you just wrote, or alternatively, and I highly recommend you do this to be honest, I recommend you go back and download that checkpoint.zip file and follow through these directions anyways, just to avoid the possibility of you having made any typo as we went through all that typing in the last couple of videos. So either way, either continue on if you're really confident with the code you wrote. Otherwise, make sure you've got that checkpoint.zip file from the last lecture. So let's get to it. We're going to make use of the checkpoint.zip file. The first thing I'm going to do is go to my terminal. I'm in a workspace directory of sorts. Inside of here, you'll see the front end project we worked on, the Redis image, and simple web. I'm going to make sure that inside of here, I have a folder called complex. That's going to be the name of this application. It is a complex application. I'm going to change into that folder. And then I'm going to open up a file and folder explorer based on that folder. So here's the complex folder right here. I'll then get the checkpoint zip file that I just downloaded as well. So here's checkpoint.zip. I'm going to extract everything inside there. So here's everything that was inside of that zip file. Inside that zip file, you'll see the client, server, and worker directories. So I'm going to take these three folders and I'm just going to copy them all over to the complex directory, overwriting anything that is already in there. So now if I go back over to my terminal, inside the complex directory, and I list out all my files and folders, I should see the client, the server, and the worker inside of here. Cool. So that's pretty much it. Again, you had to go through those steps if you did not write that code with me. If you did write the code with me, I still recommend you make use of everything inside the checkpoint.zip file just to avoid the possibility of there being any little typos in there or anything like that. So now that we are all caught up and we're all back together with all the source code we need, let's take a quick break. In the next section, we're going to start putting together some Docker containers for each of those different parts of our application. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we did a little bit of reconciliation. So if you skipped over all the source code files, hopefully you now have a complex directory and inside there is the client, server, and worker folders. And each of those folders represent the React server, the Express API, and the worker process as well. We're now gonna start the process of adding Docker containers to each of these applications so we could, that we can start each of them up inside of a development environment. So we're going to take the React project, the Express API, and the worker as well, and we're going to make dev Docker files for each one. Now, the key thing here that I want to make sure is really clear, at this point, we are focusing on development versions of Docker containers for each one. So I want to make sure that we have a smooth development process. We're not just going to skip all the way to the end here of deploying everything out to production. That would make life a little bit too easy. So we're going to first make kind of development versions of containers for each of these applications and make sure that there is a very smooth workflow. So in other words, I want to make sure that if I make some change to some code inside of, say, the client project or the server project, I want to make sure that I don't have to rebuild my entire image to get those changes into effect, because that's a really slow development workflow. We don't want to have to rebuild an image every time that we make one little change to the source code of a project. So in practice, what does that mean? Well, it means that we need to look at the project files inside of each of those directories. And inside of each of them, we're going to set up a pretty similar Docker file workflow. Remember that each one of these projects is probably going to have a package.json file that records all of the dependencies of our project. So we're going to copy over that package.json file as step number one. We're then going to run an npm install, and then we'll copy over everything else. The last thing to keep in mind is that we're going to set up a Docker Compose file, and that Docker Compose is going to set up volumes for each of these projects so that we kind of share all of the source code inside of each project. And that's what's going to make sure that we don't have to rebuild our image entirely from scratch every time that we make one tiny little change. Okay, so with all that in mind, let's get started right now. I'm going to find my terminal. 
and I'm going to start up my code editor based on that complex directory. Now again, quick reminder here, I've set up the code command line tool so that I can use it directly from my command line. If you don't have that set up, basically at this point, you just want to open up your code editor based on that complex directory. So you should see client, server, and worker. Now I think a good place to get started would be on a Docker file or a development Docker file for our client directory. Because this project right here, we've already set up a Docker file kind of in the last section when we went through the deployment of the first application we put together. So inside of my client directory, I'll get started by making a new file called dockerfile.dev. Again, we're making use of this added extension right here to indicate that this is a Docker file only for use during development of our application. Then inside of here, we're gonna add essentially same exact stuff that we had before. We're gonna specify a base image of Node Alpine. I'm gonna set up a working directory of app. I'm gonna copy the package.json file over. I'll run npm install. I'll copy over everything else. And then finally, I'll run a command of npm run start, like so. So this is the same Docker file that we put together just a moment ago, and we're probably gonna end up using a very similar one in our other two projects as well, with maybe just one or two, one or two small little tweaks. Now to test this out, I'm gonna flip back over to my terminal. I'm gonna run the docker build command inside of the client directory, and I'm gonna make sure that I specify the dockerfile.dev file as the Docker file of choice. So back at my terminal, I'll change into the client directory, and I'll execute docker build. I'm going to specify the docker file to use for this by adding on the dash f flag. I'll say docker, docker file.dev, and then I'll put a period on to specify the build context. And remember, I'm specifying the build context right here of period. That means use the current directory. In order for everything to work the way we expect, I have to be inside the client directory. So this is where that whole idea of build context is start going. Is, excuse me, is going to start getting really important, and we'll talk in great detail about this build context stuff in just a moment as well. Okay, so I'm going to run that. We'll very quickly see pulling the Node Alpine image. It's then going to do the npm install. During the npm install process, you might see a warning or three. Warnings are totally fine, so don't worry if you see a warning. No issue with that whatsoever. If you don't see any warnings, that's also, also totally okay. No problem with that as well. Now the npm install is gonna take just a moment. After that runs, it's gonna execute the copy instruction and pull over all the rest of the project files and then start up everything inside there by setting the default command of npm run start, which is how you start up an application that has been created with Create React App. Now this might take a moment or two. Okay, well, it's just about done. So let's just hold on for just a second here. It's all done with the npm install. So it's now going to do the copy step in just a second to pull over all the other source code files we have inside of our project, like say the SRC folder in the public directory. Then once that's all done, it'll set the default command and that's pretty much it. There's our container right there. So let's now try starting this up by running docker run with the container ID. So I'll do docker run and I'll paste that ID in. We'll then see the React script start up we should see starting the development server, and then eventually the application should start up. Something like this right here. Now, if you see any message that says something about like an unused variable or anything like that, anything that seems to indicate an error, that means that you very likely made a typo when we were putting the application together. And so you will want to go back to the last section where we downloaded that checkpoint zip file and overwrite your files with everything from that zip file, just to make sure that you're using the exact same code that I am. All right, so that's one Docker file done. Let's take care of the other two for the server and worker projects in the next section. So I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, we're gonna to start to set up development Docker files for our server and worker projects. The development Docker files that we're gonna use for both these are gonna be just about identical to what we just did for the client. So we're gonna go through these pretty darn quickly. Inside of my server folder, I'll make a new file called dockerfile.dev. Inside of here, we'll specify the node alpine image again as our base. So I'll say from node alpine, we'll set up a working directory of app. I'll copy over the package.json file. I will run npm install. 
we'll copy over everything else, and then finally we'll set up our default command. Now in the development environment, the startup command is going to be just a little bit different for the server and the worker. If you open up the package.json file, you'll notice that we set up a dev script in both of both of these of simply nodemon. Nodemon is a little command line tool that can be used to automatically reload your entire project whenever any of the source code inside of your project is changed. And so we're going to take advantage of that as we are running our Docker containers to make sure that anytime we've set up a volume and our source code changes and the volume updates as well, we'll get our application to automatically restart with the Nodemon tool. Explaining this with words is a little bit challenging. It's one of those things where it makes a lot more sense to see it in action. So let's just put together the Docker file and you'll see this in action very quickly. So the last thing we have to do inside of here is specify the primary command. We'll do npm run dev. I'll save this file and then I'll make another file identical to it inside of the worker directory. So in the worker folder, I'll make a new file called dockerfile.dev and I'm gonna copy everything from the first one into the second one. So now they both have a primary command of npm run dev. Let's now try building images out of both these projects. It should go pretty quickly. So I'm back inside of my complex folder. I'll change into server. And inside of here, I'll do docker build dash f, dockerfile.dev, and then don't forget the dot at the very end. That's going to run the npm install, but for the Backend API server, the npm install is going to go much more quickly than it did for the front end application because we have far fewer dependencies. Again, if you see any warnings there, totally okay, no issue with that. Here's our image ID. We'll test it out very quickly with a Docker run ID. You might notice this error right here of connection refused. That's totally fine. We're seeing this message because we are not running a Redis server or a Postgres server right now. In particular, this error message is coming from the lack of a Postgres server. I'm going to stop that by hitting Control C, and we'll go try building out our worker process as well. So in my worker directory, I'll do a docker build dash f docker file oop docker file dot dev period. It's going to re run the npm install here again. Again, this will be very quick because we have very, very few dependencies on the worker project in particular. I see a couple warnings. Again, not an issue there. We eventually end up with our ID, and I'll start up a test container with that. And everything's looking pretty good. No error messages whatsoever. OK, I'm going to stop everything by hitting Control C, and then I'll change back out to the complex directory. And I think that's pretty much it for the development Docker files. So let's take another quick pause and we'll continue in the next section. In the last section, we put together Docker files for the client, the server, and the worker projects. Now that we've got Docker files for each of those put together that are specifically made for the development environment, we're going to start putting together a Docker compose file as well, just as we did on the previous application. Remember, the entire point of this Docker Compose file is to make sure that it's a lot easier to start up each of these different images as containers with the appropriate arguments. For example, we need to make sure that the Express server is available on some given port. Same thing with React server. We need to make sure that the worker has the ability to connect over to Redis. We need to make sure that the correct environment variables for connecting to Redis and Postgres are provided to the Express server and the worker as well. And so this is all configuration that is going to be done inside of our Docker Compose file. All right. Now the first file, the first container that we're going to add of our own custom project to our Docker Compose file is going to be the server process. So just that Express server by itself. At the same time, we're also going to start adding the Postgres server or the Postgres database and the Redis database to the Compose file as well. So in our development environment, we will have a complete copy of the Express server, a complete copy of Redis, and a complete copy of Postgres, and they're all going to work together very nicely. Once we get these three pieces put together, we'll then come back and start to add in the React application, the worker, and the Nginx server as well. All right, now I've got a couple notes on this diagram right here of some of the things that we need to think about inside of the Compose file. So we know that we need to add in Postgres. We, need, we know that we need Redis in there as well. And in both those cases, we need to figure out what image we should use for both of them. 
For the server, we probably need to specify some of the options that we had seen on the last Docker Compose file we put together. So we probably need to specify some build options. For example, what Docker file to use. We probably need to set up some volumes to make sure that anytime we change some of our source code, the container source code updates as well. And then this is gonna be something that we have not done before, but this is gonna be something that becomes very important in this application. We're gonna to have to start thinking about specifying some environment variables for the server as well. Just in case you downloaded the checkpoint zip file and you didn't go through the assembly of the server with me, I encourage you to open up the server directory right now. And inside of here, you'll see a keys.js file. This right here is a listing of environment variables that we need to make sure are set up for this container. So the server application needs to be given a Redis host, a Redis port, a Postgres user, Postgres password, Postgres port, all these different environment variables. They all need to be passed into this container when it is executed. And so that's something that we're going to be doing via our Docker Compose file. But again, we'll get to that a little bit later on in the process. Right now, let's get started by creating the Docker Compose file, and we'll add a little bit of basic configuration in there for the Postgres and the Redis applications. All right, so inside of my root project directory, I'm not inside of any folder right now, in my root project directory, I'll make a docker-compose.yml file. Inside of here, we'll put down some of the immediate configuration that we know that we always add to every Docker Compose file. I'll say version is three, like so. After that, we'll then start to specify the list of different services that should be made available when we use this Docker Compose file as a starting point for our application. So the first service that we're going to define will be a Postgres instance. So I'm gonna give this a name of Postgres. Remember, that's the name of the service as it's been added to our Docker Compose file now. So for the Postgres project, we don't have to specify the build options or volumes or anything like that that we did previously. Instead, the only thing we need to specify here is the image that we want to use for this particular service. And so in this case, we're gonna go up to Docker Hub. We're gonna take a look at the different versions of Postgres that are available and we'll specify one to be used as the base image for our project. So inside of my browser, I'm gonna to navigate to hub.docker.com. I'll find explore on the top right-hand side. And then if we scroll down a little bit, we'll very quickly see, what was the first one? Postgres, wanna make sure I wasn't looking at Redis. So right here on this list, you should see Postgres official very quickly pop up. And then under the full description for Postgres, we'll see a couple of the different versions that are available. At this point in time, the latest tag is associated in here, where is it with, uh, here we go, version 10 of Postgres. Now, if you see a latest tag being applied to version 11 or even version 12 at some point in the future, that's totally fine. We are not using any advanced features of Postgres right now. And so you can safely use the latest tag probably without any issue whatsoever. So back inside of my Docker Compose file, I'm going to say that the image to use for the Postgres service will be Redis, or excuse me, not Redis, I keep mixing the two up, Postgres colon latest. Oop, latest, like so. So now anytime that Docker Compose starts up, it's going to try to create a Postgres service using the image Postgres, and it'll use the version of it tagged as latest. Let's very quickly test this out. So I'll save this file. I'll go back over to my command line. I'm inside of the complex directory and I see the Docker Compose file inside of here. So I will run Docker Compose up. That will automatically pull down the Postgres image and start up a Postgres database on my machine. And so after a little bit of download and setup, you should eventually see a line that says something like database system is ready to accept connections down here. All right, so that's it for Postgres. Now, one thing I want you to be aware of is that on the Postgres document or the repository, you can scroll down quite a bit and down here, you'll eventually see something that says start a Postgres instance. And it shows you how to execute the Docker run command while specifying the Postgres password to use right here. And if you scroll down even more, you'll see that they are showing a lot of different optional values you can pass in as environment, environment variables so that you can customize the way in which this Postgres image behaves. 
So we are going to make use of these in just a little bit. So I just want you to be aware that we're going to come back to this page pretty quickly and reference some of this further documentation. But for right now, let's take a quick pause. When we come back to the next section, we'll start setting up our Redis service as well. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we added in Postgres as a service to our Docker Compose file. So now anytime we run Docker Compose up, we'll get a copy of Postgres automatically made available to us. We're now going to go through the same process for Redis this time. I think you have a good idea of what we're looking for when we look at these repositories. So I think that we can add in this image rather quickly and then very quickly move on to the server configuration as well. So back on hub.docker.com, I'm again on the Explore tab. I'll scroll down a little bit and find the Redis image right here. Here's Redis. Again, we can look at the full description and find the one marked as latest. So right now for me, it's version four. If latest is associated with version five or even version six at some point in the future, again, no big issue. It should work just fine with our application. Now, again, you might want to scroll down a little bit and take a look at how we can start up a copy of this thing along with some of the optional commands associated with it or additional options you might want to add in. Now, in this case, you and I don't really need to do any further configuration of Redis, unlike some further configuration that we'll do of Postgres. So if you want to, you can read over this documentation. Otherwise, we'll just flip back over to our code editor inside of our Docker Compose file and add it as an additional service that we need to get our application running. So I'll give it a name of Redis, and I'll say the image that we want to use is Redis colon latest, like so. Okay, so that's it for... Postgres and Redis. All we had to do there was specify the images. A little bit later, we might come back and add in a couple more options to configure the way they behave. So now we're going to move on to our server. So on the server, we're going to see a couple of options that are more like some of the options we've seen in Compose files before. So we need to pass in some build options to tell Docker Compose how to build an image out of our source code. We need to set up some volumes to make sure that any time we change our source code, those changes automatically get reflected inside of the container. And then we're also going to have to eventually set up some environment variables because we want to customize the way in which our container behaves when it is started up. And in particular, we want to customize the way in which it finds the Redis host and the database and all that other good stuff. So let's first begin with the stuff we know how to do. We're going to add in some specification for the build and volumes. Back inside of my Docker Compose file, I'm going to add in a new service called server. And then we'll specify the build option. So for the build, I'm going to first specify the Docker file that I want this thing to use. I want this to use the dockerfile.dev file. So I will say dockerfile.dev. You'll notice that I am not specifying any folder on here. So I'm not saying like, oh yeah, look in the server directory or something like that. When we specify the Docker file, we are just saying the name of the Docker file. That's it, nothing else. To specify that we want it to look in the server folder, that's what the context property is for. So every time that we've ever made use of context in the past, we've always done something like a simple dot. And the dot meant look in the current working directory. But in this case, we are going to be executing the docker compose command from our root project folder. And inside of the root project folder is the server folder. So when we tell docker compose to build an image for our project, we're going to say, I want you to use a context or I want you to use the source code inside of the server directory. So I'm going to provide a path to the server directory. This means look in the current working directory, find a folder called server. And inside of there, use all the files and all the folders inside there to build this image. And by the way, inside of this context is where you are going to also find our Docker file as well. So that's why we are using build context here. We are trying to specify the exact directory that we want Docker to use to build our image out. Okay, so that's it for specifying the build. We'll now specify the volume to set up as well. And just like before on our React application, we're gonna do a very similar process. So for volumes, we're gonna say, a quick reminder here before we specify the volume, if you look in the server dockerfile.dev file, 
you'll remember that we specified a work directory of slash app. So everything that's relevant to us is inside of that app folder. So for volumes, the first thing we're going to do is essentially put a little bit of a block or essentially kind of like a little hold or a bookmark on the app node modules folder. And we're going to say, you know what, inside the container, don't try to override this folder. Don't try to overwrite it. Don't try to redirect access to it. Just leave that folder as is. And then in addition to that, we're going to say, look at the server directory and copy everything inside there into the app folder of the container. So for that, I'll say dot slash server colon app. So now anytime our application tries to access anything inside of the app directory inside the container, except for the node modules folder, it's going to essentially get redirected back to the server directory inside of our current project folder. So now anytime we make any change to anything, anything inside that server, it will be automatically reflected inside of the app folder of our container. And that's going to make sure that we don't have to rebuild our image anytime that we make a little change to our source code. And again, we're going to see a great example of that as soon as we start everything up. Okay, so let's take a quick pause right here. Now that we've added in a little bit more configuration, we're going to come back to the next section and we're going to start to specify some of the environment variables inside of our container. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we set up some configuration inside of our Docker Compose file for Postgres, Redis, and our server. We have one last thing to do. We need to make sure that we provide some environment variables off to the server service. So inside of our Docker Compose file, here's the server right here. We're gonna add on another section of configuration to specify some number of configuration variables. The configuration that we're going to pass in here is going to customize the way in which our server behaves when it is started up as a container. Just in case you didn't go through all the configuration with me a couple videos ago, if you look in the server directory and find the keys.js file, you'll find a bunch of references to something called process.env. These are all environment variables. And so essentially, when the server starts up, it's going to look at its environment and it's going to try to pull some information from the environment. And it's then going to use that information to customize the way in which it behaves. In our case, the server relies upon these environment variables for deciding how it's going to connect to its instance of Redis and how it's going to connect to the Postgres server as well. Now we've not yet gone through the process of setting up any environment variables through Docker Compose. So let's look at a diagram really quickly just to get a better idea of how to do this. Okay, so here's how we specify environment variables in a Docker Compose file. And I'm showing you some very fine grained details about the different syntax that we're going to use. So on the left hand side, you'll see the syntax that you and I are going to use most frequently. We specify the name of the variable, then an equal right here, and then the value that we want to set it to. This is going to set up a variable inside the container at runtime of the container. So what I mean by runtime right here is you'll recall that when we build an image, it's a two-step process, or I should say when we build and run an image, it's really a two-step process. The first step is when we build the image. That's the kind of preparation part. That's where we create a new image. And then at some point in the future, when we actually run the container, that's the second part. That's when we actually take the image and create an instance of the container out of it. When we set up an environment variable inside of a Docker Compose file, we are setting up an environment variable that is applied at runtime. So only when the container is started up. So when you specify an environment variable inside of a Docker Compose file, that information is not being encoded inside the image. The image doesn't like get created and have some memory of this environment variable. It's only when a container is created, a environment variable is set up inside of the container. And you'll see another syntax over here for setting up an environment variable on the right hand side. You can specify just the variable name by itself without any equal sign or any value for it. If you specify just the variable name, then the value for this variable is going to be taken from your computer. So if you have some environment variables set up on your machine, like let's say some secret API key or something like that, that might be when you want to use this variable name syntax by just itself without specifying any value. 
because then you don't have to specify or hard code in any specific value for the API key or excuse me, for the environment variable. It'll be taken from your machine at runtime and it's not gonna be saved along with the source code of your project or the Docker compose file or anything like that. So in our case, we want to always use the same set of variable names and values inside of our Docker compose file and we are not adding any environment variables directly to our machine. That's why we're gonna use this syntax on the left-hand side. So let's try it out right now. I'm gonna find my server configuration section and then on the same tab level as build and volumes, I'll specify environment like so. Now really quickly, in case English is a second language for you or even if it's your first, environment is a tricky word. So I gotta ask you, please pay very close attention to the spelling on this word right here. It has an N right in the middle right there. So environ meant, M-E-N-T. So inside of here, we're going to add an array of environment variables. And remember, we specify an array with a single dash like so. Every record in this array will get its own individual dash. The first environment variable that we're going to specify is the Redis host, which is kind of like the URL that our server should reach out to to access Redis. So for this, I'll specify the key, Redis underscore host, then the equals, and then the value on the right-hand side. Now, in our case, I'm gonna, this is kind of a gimme for the value of Redis host right here. Remember that any time that we access a service that has been defined inside of a Docker Compose file, we just specify the name of the service. We don't have to do any additional like, oh yeah, go over to this particular IP or anything like that that is hosting the service. We just put the name of the service in. So in our case, the name of the Redis host is going to be simply Redis, because that's the name of the service that was created for host hosting, excuse me, hosting our Redis service. So we'll say Redis host is simply Redis, like so. The next environment variable that we need to specify is the Redis port. Now this one is a little bit more challenging. For this, you might look at the documentation for Redis on Docker Hub. Let's do that right now very quickly. If you go back over to Docker Hub and go to the Explore tab, you can scroll on down to Redis right here. And then in the full description, you can scroll down a little bit. And you'll notice that to start a Redis image, you want to connect to the default port of 6379. Now this can be configured on the Redis image, but for us, there's no reason in configuring it. We're just gonna leave it as 6379. So back inside of my Docker compose file, I'm gonna specify another environment variable of Redis underscore port equals 6379. So in both these cases right here, we used the first syntax of defining an environment variable. We put the variable name in, an equal sign, and then the value that we want to set it to. And we use this syntax over here because we did not want to attempt to pull the value from my shell or my computer, essentially, because I do not have any environment variables defined on my computer of Redis host or Redis port. Okay, so that's our two first environment variables. Now we've got a handful of others that we're going to go through rather quickly. So the other ones we have to define are PG user, host, database, password, and port. Now, as a quick tip here, if you are making use of Atom or VS Code, I think this hotkey works with other editors as well, but this is those are the only two editors where I know for sure this hotkey works. In order to get these key names over to the Docker Compose file very quickly, you can highlight dot, env dot right there, and then press Command D several times, and that will do a multi-select on that text selection. You can then press right on your arrow key, and then option shift right arrow. And that will select just the keywords like so. You can then do a command C, go back over to the Docker compose file, and then do a command V to paste all that stuff in. And so that's just saving us from having to do a little bit of typing. So now I'll add in all of my little dashes here. And actually, you know, technically you can use the same command D multi-select hotkey here as well if you want to. And then we'll add in equal signs on the right-hand side of each of these. All right, so for each of these, we're gonna do a little bit more research on the Postgres documentation back on Docker Hub. So I'm gonna go back over to Docker Hub, 
I'll find the Explore tab. And again, I'll search for Postgres on this list. Here it is right here. And like I said just a moment ago, if you scroll down a pretty good amount, you'll see some documentation on the default values for each of those variables. So for Postgres password, somewhere in here, it will tell you the default password. Actually, I'm not sure that it actually tells you what the default is. It might be a little bit higher up here. Oh, come on, I don't wanna look forever. Where is it? Okay, it doesn't actually tell us the default password, but I'll just tell you right now, the default password for Postgres is Postgres password. We're gonna to connect to a default database of Postgres. The default user that we'll connect to is Postgres. The host, which is very similar to the Redis host that we defined up here, is also Postgres because that's the name of our Postgres service that we defined right here. And then finally, the port, and that's something you can reference the documentation for back over here. You'll notice expose 5432. That's the default port for Postgres. And so we'll do 5432 for that one as well. Okay, so that's it. So hopefully you're starting to learn here that getting some information from these very common images that you'll probably use, such as Postgres or MySQL or Redis, you have to look at the documentation for the repository to get some information about the default values here to make use of with that image. So let's save this Docker Compose file, and we're gonna very quickly test this out at our terminal. I know this is a really long section, but we're almost done with this. So I'll go back over to my terminal. I'm gonna stop everything with Control C and I'll do a docker compose up. Now that's going to rebuild the server image from scratch. The npm install you recall for the server does not take very long, so we'll just wait a couple of seconds here. There it goes. And then it's gonna to start to create all those different services and eventually we see listening up here. Perfect. So that's looking pretty good. Let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue in the next section. In the last section, we added in a ton of configuration to our Docker Compose file to get our server up and running. The server is now aware of a couple of different environment variables that it's going to need to successfully connect to both Redis and Postgres. We're now gonna to start to move forward. The other two sections of configuration that we need to add into this file are services for both the worker and the client projects. So let's add both those in right now. I'm gonna go down to the bottom of the file and I'll add in a new service that we'll call client. Now for the client service, we're going to end up with a couple of different properties that are just about identical to the last Docker Compose file that we put together and even identical to the server service that we just added a moment ago as well. So for the client, we need to specify a build option for telling this thing what the context folder is and where the Docker file is. We also need to specify the relevant volumes as well to make sure that we don't have to constantly rebuild the client image every time that we change some code inside there. And then we're gonna do the exact same two steps for the worker project as well. So for build on the client, we're gonna say your Docker file is dockerfile.dev and the context is going to be the client directory. So inside the client directory is all the source code relevant for the client service. So the context will be dot slash client like so. We'll then set up the two volumes for the client. So I'll say volumes. We're going again going to say that we want to put that kind of bookmark hold on app node modules. So that's going to make sure that the node modules directory inside the container does not get overwritten by any node modules folder that we might have inside the client. And then we'll also set up the relationship between all of the source code inside the client directory and the app folder inside of the container. So I'll say everything inside the client directory should be shared with the app folder inside the container. All right, so now the last thing we need to do is set up the same service for our worker process as well. So I'll say we're gonna have a worker service. It will have a build with a Docker file of dockerfile.dev. It will have a context of the worker directory, and it's gonna have volumes of both app node modules and dot slash worker, and everything inside that folder is gonna be kind of mapped over virtually to the app folder inside of the container. All right, so that looks pretty good. Now. We're just about done with the Docker Compose file. 
but you might notice that there is one very distinct thing that we're currently missing inside the entire project. We have not yet set up any port mapping whatsoever. So there's no port mapping to expose the server to the outside world, and there's no mapping for the React project as well, as we had done on the previous React project that we just put together. Now I want to direct you back to a diagram we were looking at just a moment ago. This one right here. So we had said that with development, we were going to have this Nginx server out here that was somehow reacting to information or kind of like proxying or routing requests from the browser to the React server or the Express server. Let's take a quick pause right now. We'll come back to the next section and we'll talk about the purpose of this little Nginx thing right here and what it's going to be doing for us. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we just about finished up our Docker Compose file, but you might notice that we made absolutely no mention of any ports inside this file. And so as it stands, nothing ex is exposed to the outside world, and our browser cannot connect to any of the different servers that are listed inside of here. I also want to remind you that on this development diagram we were looking at of the overall architecture of our app, we had showed this Nginx server out in the very front of everything. Now we had made use of Nginx on the last Docker Compose project we put together that we deployed eventually off to Elastic Beanstalk. But the purpose of that Nginx server on that previous project was to host all of the different React source code files or production files really that we had put together. So that was a production environment that was making use of Nginx. This time around we're saying our development environment is going to have Nginx. So let's talk about why it's here. Okay, in this diagram, we've got the browser on the left-hand side and two of the different servers that exist inside of our development environment. Next to the browser is a list of some of the different requests that the browser is going to make to our environment. So the browser, at some point in time, is going to ask for an index.html file. It needs an HTML file to show on the screen of the browser. And when it loads up that HTML file, it's probably going to need a JavaScript file as well like some file that has all the JavaScript code for the React side of our application. Now, in addition to that, we know that the browser is also going to make some API requests to the Express server to get a list of all of the different values that have ever been submitted and a list of all the different current values that have been calculated by the worker process as well. So we know that chances are the index.html and the JS requests need to go over to this React server, but these API requests need to go over to the Express server. So we really want to have something that kind of enforces routing that looks like this. But as it stands right now, we don't really have any infrastructure whatsoever to kind of take these requests and send them to the Express server, or take these requests and send them over to the React side of things. So as you might guess, that is the entire purpose of the Nginx server that we're going to add in. The Nginx server is going to look at all these different requests and decide on which backend service of ours that we want to run, excuse me, that we want to route the request to. Now, before I show you the diagram to explain how that is done, I want to remind you something that we had written into the source code of both our client and server projects. So if you didn't watch the videos on us putting together all the source code, you might have not seen this. So you probably didn't see it. But let me just very quickly show you something on the client and server sides. In my server directory, I'll find the index.js file. Inside of here, you'll notice that all of our route handlers are like slash values slash all, or slash values slash current, or slash values. However, in the client, src, bib.js file, you can scroll down a little bit and you'll see that we are making network requests to routes of slash API, slash API, slash values current and slash values all. So the client thinks that it needs to make requests to slash API, but it's very clear that the server is not set up to receive that slash API route one bit. No configuration over here to handle that route. All right, so with that in mind, let's now take a look at what the Nginx server is going to do for us. So we're going to add in an additional container to our application by adding in a service to the Docker Compose file. That additional service is going to start up an Nginx server, and that Nginx server is going to have essentially one job. Anytime a request comes into Nginx, it's going to look at the incoming request and more specifically, it's going to look at the request path. The incoming request is going to say, okay, 
does it have slash API? If slash API is in the route that this request is trying to access, then I'm going to redirect this request over to the Express server. Otherwise, if it is not looking for something that says slash API, I'm going to direct that request over to the React server instead. And you know, I'm now thinking maybe a clearer way to organize this diagram would be to swap those two pieces like so. Okay, so think about what that's going to do. Now, anytime the browser makes a request that is intended for the API, here's the inside the src fib.js file, it is going to make a request from the browser to our backend server, the entire Docker Compose cluster, everything inside there. And these requests right here are intended for the Express API. And so they are adding on slash API to the very front. So now whenever these requests that have slash API on them in reality, come into the Nginx server, Nginx is going to say, oh, I see that you're looking for the API. So it's going to take those requests and send them on automatically to the Express server. But in the case of looking for any resources like index.html or main.js right here, it's going to say, oh, I see you are not looking for an API resource. So rather than trying to send you off to the Express API, I'm going to send your request over to the React server instead. So that's how routing is going to work in our application. And that's how we're going to make sure that we can just expose this one service right here, make requests to it, and poof, all of our requests are going to end up in the correct location. Now, the last thing you might be a little bit curious about is why did we not just assign a port to both the React server and the Express server and just try to access a port on localhost for like Express server? Well, let's think about that for a second. So essentially we're saying, why didn't we say, oh yeah, just make the Express server available on like port 3000 and the React server available on port, I don't know, 4000 or whatever it might be. And then whenever our browser makes a request, it can just specify the appropriate port. Well, the reason that we didn't do this is that think about how our application runs in a production environment. In a production environment, we probably don't want to have to worry about juggling these different ports. It'd be a lot nicer if all of our front end React code could just make requests to some common back end and not have to worry about specifying, oh, this is a request to my Express server, so I need to make sure that I'm specifying port 3000. In other words, it would not be very convenient every time that we want to make a request over here to have to append on something like, yeah, make a request to this route colon 3000 or colon 5000 or whatever it's supposed to be. It's a lot easier to just say, oh yeah, this is a request intended for this service. I'm going to put on slash API. Now you might be thinking, Stephen, well, what's the difference between adding on something to the front of the route and something to the end of the route? The difference here is that when we are specifying a port, the port can very easily change. Depending on the environment that we are deploying to, one day our API might be hosted on port 5000 inside of all these Docker Compose containers, and the next day it might be on port 50001. You just don't know. These ports are sometimes very finicky, and sometimes for various reasons they need to change all the darn time. And so it's a lot easier to just specify this very constant token right here of slash API and just say, okay, like here's slash API, this is the destination, and we can then rely upon Nginx to do the routing for us. All right, so that's why we are adding on that slash API to the front of all these routes. We're using that to specify where the request should be routed off to inside of all these different services that we are creating inside of our Docker Compose file. Now, the very last thing I want to mention here is adding on the slash API doesn't really solve the issue of how our express route handlers. So if you look at the server directory and find index.js inside there, you'll see that all of our request handlers here are not specifying a slash API on the very front of it. And the reason for that is that after Nginx does this little routing step, it's then going to chop off the slash API part of the route. So if something like API values all comes into Nginx, when it comes out of it, it's going to be simply slash values slash all, like so. That's kind of nice because it means that we can specify these routes with configuration that only really changes at the Nginx layer. And we don't have to like customize the routes defined in the Express server based upon whether it's supposed to be watching for slash API or not.
Now that is an optional setting, just so you're aware. If we wanted to, we could absolutely say, oh yeah, do not try to chop off the slash API. And we could just change all the routes on the express side to watch for slash API as well. But my personal opinion is it's easier to just chop that off. And then the express server doesn't have to always specify, oh yeah, watch for the route slash API slash whatever I actually care about. All right, so that's probably more than you ever want to know about routing. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and start putting this Nginx server together and make sure that it has some routing based upon the path name. It's a quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about how we're going to put an Nginx server into our application. Its job is going to be watch for incoming requests and route them off to the appropriate backend server. In order to set up Nginx in this fashion and give it a set of routing rules, we're going to create a file called default.conf. This is a very special file that will be added to an Nginx image that you and I are going to put together. This file is going to add a little bit of configuration to implement that set of routing rules. Now, of course, this is a course about Docker, not quite about Nginx. Nonetheless, I want to tell you a little bit about the configuration we're going to put together because I really do believe that you're going to end up using Nginx on a majority of Docker-based projects. Maybe not, but I want to at least give you a little bit of knowledge here. So inside of this configuration file, we're going to put down a little bit of configuration that is going to set up all the instructions that you see on the right-hand side. First off, we're going to tell Nginx that there is something called an upstream server at client colon 3000 and server colon 5000. Let's break down both those statements right there and kind of quantify what they're trying to communicate. So as we just said a moment ago, Nginx is going to watch for requests from the outside world and then route them to appropriate servers. These servers are kind of behind Nginx. You cannot access these servers unless you go through the Nginx server. And so Nginx refers to these as upstream servers. They are servers that Nginx can optionally redirect traffic over to. Now, in both these statements, you'll also notice that I said there is a server at client colon 3000 and server colon 5000. So as a quick reminder, when we put together our initial server implementation inside the server directory, you'll find that index.js file at the very bottom of it. You'll see that we are listening on the server on port 5000. So the server is watching for traffic on port 5000 and the client as a create react app application by default listens for traffic on port 3000. So that's where we are getting those two ports from create react app by default port 3000 our server by default port 5000. Now the client right there client colon 3000 and server colon 5000 those are both actual addresses. And so client and server are actual kind of like host names or essentially URLs that Nginx is going to try to direct traffic to. We are specifically using client and server right there because those are the names of the client and server services we put together inside of our Docker Compose file. Here's client and up here is server right here. Remember, anytime you make a Docker Compose file, the different service names are essentially used as kind of like domains of sorts. And you can refer to them in order to access the service that is hosted by the service. So that's why we're going to direct traffic specifically to client 3000 and server 5000. After we put together those two quick definitions, we'll then tell Nginx that it's going to listen by default on port 80. Now remember, this is port 80 inside the container. And so it doesn't really matter if we say port 80 or we say port 5 billion. At the end of the day, when we run our Docker Compose file, we can change the actual port that is more or less exposed to the outside world, or essentially set up that port mapping. After we do that, we'll then set up the two roles that say essentially if anyone comes to the slash or kind of root route, we want to send them to the client upstream. So that's this upstream right here. And if anyone goes to slash API, send them to the server upstream. All right, so that's what we're going to do inside this file. I figured it would be easier to tell you with a diagram rather than write out the file and tell you along the way. So let's now flip over to our code editor and we're going to put that file together. So to locate this file, I'm going to make a new folder inside of my root project directory, and I'm going to call this new folder Nginx. So inside of the Nginx folder, I'll make a new file called default.conf. Again, this is a very special file name. We're going to eventually kind of work it into a Docker file or excuse me, a Docker image in just a little bit as well. 
So make sure you specifically name it default.conf. So now inside of here, we'll set up these two upstreams. I'll first say upstream client. This sets up the definition of an upstream called client. And then inside of here, we're gonna say that it refers to a server that is hosted at client colon 3000 like so. And notice how there is a semicolon on the end of the line. So again, the syntax here says there is a upstream. We are calling it client. It is located at kind of like the domain name or the URL client port 3000. This right here is how you can access it. So now we'll do the same thing for our API as well. Now, as we put this together, you're gonna to notice something a little bit awkward. So I'm gonna say upstream server, 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 colon 5000. Now, when you look at the previous example, in order to tell Nginx that the location of this upstream is at client 3000, we use the keyword server right here. But as we set up our Docker Compose file, we've been referring to the Express API with the name of server. Like that is the name of the service as we defined it inside of the Docker Compose file. So as you might imagine, having upstream server, 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 this is really confusing. And in the world of Nginx, server might even be a protected keyword. And so if we tried using this in our configuration file, we might end up seeing an error because it might say like, hey, why are you putting the word server right here? I'm Nginx and the word server to me is an operator. So just to kind of make Nginx a little bit happy, we're gonna change our terminology for our backend server or the backend service of server just a little bit. So we're going to refer to this as the API rather than as the name of server. And so that also includes our Docker Compose file. Inside of Docker Compose, rather than giving this a name of server, we're going to call it API like so. And again, we're just doing this to make Nginx happy so that we don't use the word server all over the place and probably end up with like a syntax error when Nginx tries to make use of our default.conf file. Okay. Now, again, please make sure you got a semicolon on the end of that line. And then underneath those two upstream definitions, we'll then set up this kind of server block that sets up the main body of configuration. So we're gonna say Nginx, we want there to be a server that listens on port 80. So notice how we got server, listen, 80, and note the semicolon right there. And then inside of here, we're gonna set up our two routing rules. We're gonna say if anyone ever goes to slash, then set up a proxy and essentially pass through this request to the client upstream. So to do so, we say proxy underscore pass HTTP colon slash slash front end like so. So if a request ever comes in that matches just slash by itself like so, take the request and send it off to this upstream. Excuse me, I put front end in here. I apologize for that, it should be client. Ugh, I feel so bad about that. Okay, hopefully you can forgive me for that. I apologize, it should be client. That's the name of the upstream, client. So now we're gonna do the same thing for API as well. I'll say location slash API. If anyone ever comes here, then pass this request upstream to HTTP colon slash slash API, like so. And then on this rule right here, we're actually gonna add in one other piece of configuration. Remember how I told you just a moment ago, when a request comes from the browser with a route of slash API, after it goes through Nginx, it kind of trims off that slash API part of the request path. Well, actually that's not a automatic operation. That is actually something that we configure. So we configure Nginx to specifically, specifically chop off that first little slash API part of the URL. And so to do so, right above the proxy pass part, we will say rewrite slash API slash parenthesis dot star, then I'll put a space in, slash dollar sign one break. So this is a rewrite directive or a rewrite rule. It means, apply a regex of slash API. So essentially match this regex right here against the path name. And if we match anything to this, then take off the API slash API and leave it as just slash dollar sign one. 
the dollar sign one right here is actually a reference to whatever text was matched by this regex right here. So essentially whatever gets matched will be added as or kind of substituted in here as dollar sign one. The break keyword on the very end is a directive, and it essentially means do not try to apply any other rewrite rules after applying this one. So if we had other rules in place to rewrite the URL or the path name here, the break keyword essentially means, hey, Nginx, don't try to do any other rewrite here. The reason that you put in break right here is essentially to keep from going through continuous rules as Nginx rewrites the URL and then tries to match it to a new route with the new rewritten URL. Then after that, we say the proxy pass to slash API like so, and that's pretty much it. Now, again, I want you to make sure, please, please, please double check, make sure you've got semicolons on the end of each of the statement lines. On my screen, they're kind of showing up as that gray that it's kind of hard to see. Just make sure that you got semicolons on the end of each of those lines. Okay, so that's pretty much it. That's all we have to put into our default.com file. Now, the last thing we have to do and I'm going to kind of just throw this at you out of the blue because I didn't really mention it earlier on. We put together the default.conf file, but we need to actually kind of get it into Nginx in some way. So if you remember the diagram we were looking at before, everything else inside of here was a Docker container. Well, that's no different with Nginx. We're going to create a separate Nginx container. We're going to build a Docker file for it and we're going to essentially get our configuration file into Nginx through the use of that Docker file. So let's take a quick pause right here. We'll come back to the next section. We're gonna to put together a Docker file that is going to create a Nginx custom image that has a little bit of custom configuration applied to it. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our default.com file. And now we're going to put together a Docker file that will create a new custom Nginx image and attempt to apply this configuration file to it. Now, if that sounds hard, let me assure you it's gonna be way easier than you ever might guess. Let's first begin by pulling up Docker Hub and I wanna very quickly look up the Nginx image that we can download automatically from Docker Hub. So I'll go to hub.docker.com. I'll go to the Explore tab up top. And then as the very first result, or hopefully it'll be one of the first ones for you, sometimes it kind of argues with Alpine for top stop bot, I'll look at Nginx. So we'll look at the full description here. As usual, you'll notice there's a bunch of links for help. And you can look down here. And eventually you're going to see somewhere inside of here, uh, right here. Here's a great example right here. So in order to do any customization of Nginx, essentially all we have to do is build a Docker file that says we want to make an image from Nginx, and then we're going to take our configuration file and copy it into the temporary container, or essentially the image. All the configuration for Nginx is done by these files, or these configuration files, that simply exist on the hard drive. So as long as we, or excuse me, not the hard drive, but you understand, the file system. So as long as we copy that configuration file into our image, it will be automatically applied to Nginx once a container starts up out of our custom image. So essentially, what you see right here is all we really have to do inside of our Docker file. Remember that if we do not replace the default command of a image inside of the Docker file, then the default command of the parent image, which is from Nginx right here, will automatically take precedence. Okay, so let's get to it. I'm going to flip back over to my code editor. Inside the Nginx folder, I'll make a new file called dockerfile.dev. And then inside of here, I'll set up the base image with from Nginx. And then we're going to copy the default.conf file into the file system of this image. So I'll say copy default.conf. And technically we should do on a relative path like so. And then the folder that we're going to copy it over to is slash etc nginx conf.d. Now in every other case we've ever made use of this copy command, we've been copying files into a directory. We can actually specify the exact file name to copy our file into. And if that file already exists inside the image, then it will be overwritten. So there is a default.conf file that is included with nginx by default. So by putting on default.conf right here, we're saying very clearly, yes, take my file and overwrite the existing one. Just overwrite whatever is there. 
And that's exactly what we want to do in this case. We want to overwrite that default file. All right, so that's pretty much it. I'm going to save this. And now the last thing we have to do is add this nginx as a service to our Docker Compose file. So I'm going to open up Docker Compose file. And we'll add in a new nginx service to this thing. Now I'm just going to add it towards the top here just because I'm lazy. It doesn't really matter where you add it. Okay, so the new service will be called nginx. We could just as easily have called this like our router or our proxy or whatever you want to call it. In this case, I'll just call it nginx just because I don't really have a better name off the top of my head. Now this is definitely a service that we want to make sure is always running 100% of the time no matter what. And so I am going to use that restart policy that we spoke about a while ago on here. So I'm going to re say restart always like so. Because no matter what, I always want to make sure nginx is ready to go. If the API crashes, or if my, say, worker crashes, if the worker crashes in particular, I'm definitely okay with this thing just crashing out and burning and staying off. Because remember, the worker is doing the processing for our actual Fibonacci value. And that is kind of a expensive computation. And so if the worker is misbehaving in some way, I kind of am okay with it just crashing and staying off because I wouldn't want it to be accidentally consuming a ton of CPU cycles. But in the case of Nginx, this thing is routing traffic to our entire application. And so no matter what, I got to have Nginx running. So then inside of here, we'll also specify a build because we have a custom version of Nginx that we're putting together. So I'll specify its Docker file as dockerfile.dev and I'll set up its context as the Nginx directory. And then finally, unlike a lot of the other things we put together inside of here, this will have a port mapping. So I'm going to say ports, and I want to map how about port, I don't know, 3050 on my local machine should be mapped up to port 80 inside the container. So remember, you and I, once we start up Docker Compose, we're going to be accessing this port right here on localhost. And so if you want something else here, you could do, you know, 4,000, 3,000, whatever it might be. Totally up to you. All right, so I think that's just about it. Let's take another pause right here. Make sure you save this file, and then we'll test everything out in the next section. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we added in Nginx service to our Docker Compose file, and we're now ready to actually test this out at our terminal and inside the browser. Now, before we test it out, I just want you to know that it is extremely likely that the first time we start this thing up, it will crash. It's very likely that one of these services is going to fail to start up appropriately. The reason for that is that the first time that we start up Docker Compose, we have to build and download many of these different images. And some of the code around the API and some of the code around the worker kind of want to make sure that a copy of Redis is already running before they start up. And so it's entirely possible that since it might take longer this first time to start up Redis, either the worker or the API might fail to start up appropriately. I really do also expect Nginx to crash the first time we run it, but since we put on the restart policy right here, it should automatically reboot itself and keep going. So with that all that in mind, we're probably going to start up Docker Compose one time and then maybe just kill it right away and then start it up a second time, okay? All right, so let's get to it. I'll flip over to my terminal. Now I've got a previous copy of Docker Compose running. I'm going to kill it by hitting Control C. And then I will start up all of the services listed inside of my Docker Compose file with Docker Compose up. And I'm going to force a rebuild of everything by adding on the dash dash build flag. One last thing, really quickly, make sure you're in the complex directory. <laughs> Just want to make sure we're in the right spot. All right, so we're going to see a little bit of build process going on right here. This is going to take just a moment or two, so I will pause the video right here and we'll continue in the next section. Just as a quick reminder, if anything crashes, totally fine. We'll fix it all up in the next section. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started up our Docker Compose process for the first time. And the first time you start everything up, it is incredibly likely that there might be some error. The first way that you might troubleshoot this error is to restart the Docker Compose up process. So I'm going to hit Control C on my keyboard to stop every, all those different containers, and then I will immediately start them all back up again with Docker Compose up. And that's going to start everything back up a second time. Now you want to see starting the 
the development server, and then eventually a compiled successfully message. If you don't see this right here, if you see something from the client one process that says that there was a typo somewhere or that there is a invalid syntax error, then I highly recommend that you go back about 10 lectures or so and find that zip file that I posted with the completed version of kind of the intermediate code. Download that zip file and extract it into your project directory, overriding any existing files. You can then restart the Docker Compose process and you should see that any typos or related error messages like that go away. So now that we've got everything started up, I'm going to open up my browser and I'll try testing out this application. I want you to recall that inside of our, where is it, inside of our Docker Compose file right here, our Nginx service has its port mapped to 3050 on our local machine. So to access our running application, we're going to navigate to localhost 3050. I'll flip on over to my browser. I'll open up localhost colon 3050, and I should see a page like this appear on the screen. Now, if you open up your Chrome console by hitting right click and then inspect right here, or if you're on Windows, you can hit F12, you might see in the console a little red error message like this right here. That's totally fine. We're going to fix this up in just a second. Essentially, we're seeing this error message because anytime our React application boots up in development mode, it wants to keep a active connection to the development server and be notified of any time that some file changes. Now, totally, you know, normally we wouldn't really worry about that too much, but as it stands, by not setting up this WebSocket connection, we're actually going to very significantly impact the performance of our application, which we can see by entering in a value to this input right here. I'm going to try entering in an index for a Fibonacci value to calculate of 5, and then I'll submit it. Now, you might see, if you have your network request tab open over here, you might see that the values request takes a really long time. And if it does, that's totally fine. We're going to fix it up by making this error go away in just a moment. But eventually, hopefully, that request will resolve. You should then be able to refresh the page and see indexes I have seen with 5 appear and see that for an index of 5, we got a calculated Fibonacci value of 8. And so if I go back over to my chart over here, for an index of 5, yep, we would expect to see a Fibonacci value of 8. We can do the same thing with, say, an index of 6. I'll submit that refresh the page, and then I'll see for index six, I calculated a value of 13. Cool, so it looks like everything is more or less working the way we expect, with the exception of this little WebSocket error right here. So let's take a quick pause, we'll come back to the next section, and we're gonna fix up this little error message. In the last section, we got our application working, but you might notice a little red error message in the Chrome console, something about a WebSocket connection. So again, the issue here is that our browser and the running React app inside of it wants to get an active connection back to the development React server so that it gets a notification anytime that our source code changes, telling it that the browser needs to automatically reload. The problem is that we have not set up our Nginx server to successfully allow through WebSocket connections. And so in this section, we're going to make a little change to the configuration file of our Nginx server and solve that issue. So to get started, I'm going to open up my code editor. I'll find the nginx default.conf file. Inside of the server block, we're going to expose one routing layer or one route through the nginx server that will allow a WebSocket connection to be made with the running React pro process. Now, if you look at the WebSocket request very carefully, you'll notice that it says WebSocket on a path of socket.js node. So that's the route that we're going to look for and proxy it up to a backend. So I'll say location slash socjs dash node. We'll do a proxy pass to HTTP slash slash client semicolon. And then to specifically allow WebSocket connections, we'll add on a proxy HTTP version of 1.1, a proxy set header of upgrade, and then HTTP upgrade with a dollar sign in front of it. Don't miss the dollar sign. And then finally, proxy set header connection upgrade. Oops, let me get my spelling there. Upgrade, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna save this file. And now that we made a change to the Nginx server, we need to rebuild our Nginx container. So to do so, I'll flip back over to my terminal again, where I have my running Docker Compose process. I'm going to hit Control-C to stop all the running containers, 
and then I'll run docker compose up dash dash build again. Now this build should be very quick because we don't have to redo all those npm installs. And so almost instantly we should see everything start to open back up. Now again, if you see any error messages here, I highly recommend that you hit control C and just restart everything with a docker compose up. Like I said, at this point, there's a couple of kind of dependency issues where sometimes the API is going to load up a little bit too quickly and it's going to come online before Redis or Postgres are ready to receive connections. But when we eventually deploy this, we're going to put a little fix in that's going to make sure that that will not be an issue in a production environment. So if I now start everything back up again and then go back to my browser at localhost 3050, I'll refresh the page. It looks like I got the error message to go away, and now you should still be able to enter in, say, an index of seven, submit it, refresh, and see for index of seven, I calculated 21. Cool, so it looks like our application is doing pretty darn well. You might also notice that we've got the two somewhat hard to see links here, but they do exist. You can click on other page. This is now a distinctly different route, you'll notice. And if you refresh the page, it does successfully still load up the React application, which is exactly what we wanted. I can then click on home to go back to the home route, refresh again, and again, everything works as we would expect. So I think the application is in a great state. It definitely looks like it's working the way we would expect. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and start talking about deploying this off to Amazon Web Services. So I'll see you in just a moment.